Hello. Uh, so um, my name is Ben Collier. Uh, nice to see you today. Uh, so I'm from the Cambridge Cyber Crime Centre, and I'm going to be talking today about some of our work looking at evaluating law enforcement interventions in the market for denial of service for hire services. So this is part of a strand of work we've been doing, looking at evaluating sort of law enforcement interventions in cybercrime markets. And today I'll be talking about specifically our work on looking at the market for uh, denial of service for hire services. Um, don't worry, I'll explain what those are if you don't know. Uh, so these are my lovely co-authors for this work, uh, Daniel Thomas, Richard Clayton, Alice Hutchings, who will be speaking later today uh, on our work on e-whoring, and Ildi uh, yeah. yeah. So uh, today, this is a rough outline of what I'll be discussing over the next half hour. Uh, so first, I'll be talking a bit about cybercrime generally and explain to you what a booter service is, what denial of service attacks are, uh, and some of the uh, interventions that we've been looking at. So then go to talk a bit more about kind of like law enforcement online, uh, some of the problems that arise, uh, some of the particular issues that online law enforcement um, faces. Uh, and particularly we'll be looking at centralised sort of criminal justice agencies, things like the Federal Bureau of Inspection in the US and uh, the NCA, National Crime Agency in the UK. Uh, and we'll talk a bit about some of those interventions. So then I'll talk a bit about what we actually did, so a bit about our methodology. Um, this is a, quite a complex mixed methods study, so we used a range of different methods uh, to evaluate some of these interventions, um, including both uh, qualitative, so like going out, speaking to people, interviewing people, um, looking at kind of online, uh, online sort of conversations and things like that, but also some quantitative analysis, so some actual numbers, uh, we managed to sort of measure DDoS attacks over a period of time and we could actually see and do some mathematical modelling, uh, statistical modelling of um, of uh, how effective different kinds of interventions are in this market. And finally I'll sort of run through some what we kind of found. So first off, talking about sort of law enforcement interventions online. So Dealing with cybercrime, as I'm sure you'll know, is complex and difficult. And that's because cybercrime has a lot of characteristics that more traditional types of crime doesn't or, or aren't associated with more uh, traditional types of crime that might be dealt with by the police. So it's very diffuse. Uh, it's diffused across the world. Um, cybercrime is reliant on the infrastructure, the internet, which are obviously global, and this makes things very difficult for uh, law enforcement for obvious sort of jurisdictional reasons. So, because of this international infrastructures that the internet is built up of, um, it means the victims, offenders, sort of intermediating services can be diffused across a range of different jurisdictions and countries, and this means that. If you get a report of victimization in your country and you're the police, um, the person who committed the crime and some of the infrastructure might be in a range of different countries. And so that makes it very difficult for the kind of traditional uh, mechanisms of criminal justice to work, it requires a lot of international cooperation. Additionally, we see kind of, this has been uh, further complicated by the rise of what we call sort of the cybercrime as a service model. So whereas previously in the sort of like, 80s, 90s, early 2000s. We kind of had this picture of cybercrime where it was all these, like, you know, extremely talented individuals sort of sitting at home doing these target attacks, maybe making quite a lot of money for themselves, but sort of this kind of like low, like fairly low volume, but like high harm crime, although obviously you get sort of more high volume crimes like spam. Um, this is kind of slightly. This has changed sort of over the last two decades. We've seen the rise of this kind of industrialization of cybercrime, where a lot of these people thought, you know, well, I could go and carry out sort of attacks on my own behalf, maybe make a bit of money. But really, that's a kind of a sort of a waste of resources, effectively, and it's also quite risky. So what's happened now is you've got this disintermediation of the of the value chain. So rather than carrying out attacks on their own behalf, People will often set up services, people with sort of some basic skills around the ability to carry out different types of attack or provide different services, um, will just sort of set up a service where they can sell these services to people that do want to actually commit the crime. And this is the kind of what we call the cybercrime as a service model. Um, and this is this makes it even harder for law enforcement because it means that rather than you know having a small number of people carrying out cybercrimes, 
that you can go and sort of arrest and maybe it's difficult and maybe you've got to do a lot of international cooperation between law enforcement agencies but ultimately you're looking for a fairly small number of people when you start to get these people becoming effectively infrastructure providers for cybercrime it means that the people using these these it opens it reduces the skill barrier um, because it means that basically anyone can sort of go on purchase these services and carry out attacks um, of their own and uh, this means there's a much, much larger number of people carrying out generally lower harm attacks, but that's that's quite difficult, right? You wouldn't If there's hundreds of thousands of people around the world or tens of thousands carrying out particular types of attack, that's a much harder problem if you've got to spin up all this international cooperation every time you want to arrest someone. So what we see is a focus on, and in, in terms of that, what that's meant is that uh, cyber policing or this sort of policing of cyber crime has taken on this sort of almost like risk society, sort of like a, what what's often called sort of the policing assemblage um, character, where rather than policing being focused in sort of states and centralized state organizations, we see these international networks of kind of different kinds of private and public sector actors. So police do play an important part, but so do sort of centralized agencies, so do private sector consultancy firms, security firms, and actually the infrastructure providers themselves, like people like Google, Facebook, things like this, and internet service providers all have a role to play in kind of tackling cybercrime. But that's not to say that centralized policing agencies don't do quite a lot in this space. And so in this paper, uh, what we're interested in doing is focusing on these centralized policing agencies and evaluating what the different kinds of things they try and do to intervene in these sort of online criminal markets for cybercrime services and to evaluate them, basically. So for our case study for this, we're going to look at a particular type of cybercrime, and that is uh, DDoS for hire or what are often known as booter services. So I'll explain what those are now. So DDoS is one of the kind of, or distributed denial of service or denial of service is, um, is one of the kind of uh, the classic Cyber crimes that you know if you read an uh, introductory cybercrime textbook, they'll almost they'll, they'll always mention DDoS basically. Um, this involves knocking people offline, basically knocking people and services off the internet effectively, so they can uh, function. Um, they, that might be other internet users, a bit might be schools, businesses, infrastructure. Now you know, um, especially uh, under the kind of uh, scenario we're in now, potentially, like, you know, you might, if you want to cause some trouble, you might knock a hospital offline, things like that, or knock particular services like that, that are essential offline. Um, although, it's also, you know, it, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's all sort of really um, high harm stuff. You know, obviously knocking a hospital offline is pretty serious. A lot of this is sort of pretty petty. It's kind of people attacking other people playing video games and stuff. So uh, when you carry a DDoS attack, people use a sort of variety of different methods, which I'll go into now, to overwhelm the target with too much traffic. So that can either be what it used to be in the old days when DDoS was used as a kind of protest method. You'd get lots of different people to all um, around the world try and access the same internet service at the same time. And this would create so much traffic uh, that it would not, the service couldn't handle it and it would knock the service offline. So you saw this as a kind of online digital sit-in. Effectively what happens if when you try and buy festival tickets and everyone tries to log on at 9 o'clock and it crashes the server. But um, over the years people have found lots of interesting ways to generate this sort of large amounts of traffic to knock people offline. And once people had figured out how to build sort of like, you know, botnets that can do this sort of thing, or I'll explain what these are in a minute, but uh, what are called like reflectors, um, they decided, well, you know, I could maybe knock a few people offline with my big botnet, that's great, but actually I'd like to make some proper money off of this. So they decided to sell access to these as, ser as a service, basically, to people who didn't have the skills to carry out their own attacks. So these are called booter services, because you can boot people offline, and you find them basically by typing the word booter into Google or into YouTube, and you'll get, as you can see here, a list of various different services. And as you can see, effectively, they're fairly cheap. This this service here, um, you can buy the basic package for uh, $10 a month, and that gives you unlimited attacks per day. And these are sort of small attacks for putting people off. So what we largely see, as you can see, this is what the dashboard looks like. You can see how many attacks they're doing. 
every day. So this is currently the biggest one in the world, we think. Um, yeah, and you just sort of, it's very simple. You just put your target in there. I've decided to attack the Stockholm Criminology Symposium, but you'd actually put the IP address in there. Um, and effectively what that does is you just uh, type in the IP address, you hit start attack, and theoretically knock the person offline. So what this constitutes is really the first uh, large-scale cyber attack market for people who are completely unskilled users. Um, so you don't need any, you know, any any sort of fifteen-year-old with ten dollars and a mobile phone can sign up for this, uh, and that means that and you know buy tax for often as little as five dollars a month. A lot of these services even use sort of like um, give you a free trial and things like that. So these are largely marketed almost overwhelmingly. It's not people knocking hospitals offline and things like that. This is overwhelmingly targeted at uh, video gamers. So we see this, and I don't want to um, slander uh, video gamers by uh, by saying that. This is largely like trolls, basically. These are the people that come onto your Call of Duty server and mess around and make it not very fun for everyone. So effectively what we see is people playing these online games and using these booter services to kick people off uh, lobbies, essentially, uh, to irritate them. Um, essentially trolling. They're generally advertised through a variety of places, um, uh, YouTube, uh, Twitch, um, through word of mouth. But we're also now seeing a lot of advertising going on on Discord channels and some booter services are even buying Google adverts. Um, so these were originally centered around a big online forum, uh, sort of probably the biggest kind of uh, underground sort of cybercrime forum. Uh, called hack forums, uh, but they were kicked off. So hack forums used to be a big marketplace for these services where people could advertise them. Uh, that's no longer the case. Um, they wise up and kicked all the booters off. So they're now this very dispersed set of what were previously it was quite centralized around this forum. They're now very dispersed. They're, they're sort of like lots and lots of very small services, um, which generally have their own Discord channels and, and their own like little communities. So there's around about 50, but there's loads of these. There's about 50 internationally at any given time, but the market's very concentrated. So although there's about 50 services at any given time, actually the infrastructure is very centralized. So we see um, only the top 10 really run any significant infrastructure of their own um, and everyone else buys capacity for them and resells it to their users. So we've got this cybercrime market. Uh, how do we intervene in it? Um, Intervening in online markets is really challenging for the police. Uh, they tend to be very resilient due to this kind of international um, dispersion, basically, of the market. So if I take down a market, we get this problem of displacement, basically. So if you're the FBI and you want to arrest people in the US who are running these, that's it's not straightforward, but it's, it's certainly doable. But the issue then is that everyone in America who is going for these people's services can just buy services from people in uh, Russia or Britain or, or other countries around the world. So we see this sort of classic displacement, basically. Equally, kind of really harsh policing where you go in and you crack down and you arrest loads of people causes its own harms. Um, it's not ideal, you know, it, it causes a lot of um, a lot of strain and a lot of uh, negative outcomes for people. And, and it's actually, as I said before, fairly limited in its effect on these markets. So overall, there's actually, in terms of what policing interventions work for these markets, there's still fairly little understanding of what best practice actually looks like. So for this study, we looked at four types of intervention. Um, something called messaging, uh, which is where people using sort of like things like adverts and things like that, targeting people committing these crimes. We also looked at sentencing, that's sort of like highly publicized court cases where people have been arrested, um, which you might expect to um, put people off if you see people getting long sentences for the thing that you're doing. Takedowns of infrastructure and arrests. So how did we actually do it? This was a mixed methods study, and as I said before, we used sort of a mixture of quantitative and qualitative approaches. So for the quantitative analysis, effectively, we um, came up with a way of um, basically using honeypots to measure overall what's going on in the DDoS marketplace. So um, effectively, booters use two different methods of sourcing attack power. Uh, they use botnets, which are sort of networks of infected of computers that have been infected that are controlled by a central server, 
Um, and there it's fairly obvious how you use it. You would just tell all your infected computers to direct traffic to your victim. And you also, they can use these reflectors. This is sort of like poorly set up computers around the world um, where effectively, as you can see here, if you, these computers are like badly set up. So if I send them a packet, they'll send me back a big response, basically. So as an analogy, I might say, ask this computer, give me the current time of day in every capital city in the world. That's a very small packet that goes out and you get a very big response when it sends you back. And effectively, the way these uh, these can be used to carry out DDoS attacks is, um, I might say, send this small packet and then say, yeah, I want this very big response back, but don't send it to me, send it to my friend over there. Um, and that then generates this huge wave of, tra wave of traffic. So booter services will be will scan the internet for these um, these uh, machines that can be used as reflectors in this way. And as you can see here, we set up honeypots. So we set up machines that pretend to be these sort of badly configured computers. And um, we send a response back when we see a scan, but we don't uh, take part in attacks. So if we see something that's obviously an attack, we cut it off and we don't respond. This means that every time booter providers try and use these reflector arrays for attacks, they basically tell us who they're attacking. They give us a little heads up uh, without realizing it. And this allows us to get a time series of booter attacks um, over time, uh, which we can use to sort of see whether or not interventions have been effective or not. Additionally to this, uh, we complement this with another source of data, which is because booters need to advertise, one of the best ways to advertise is to say that, like you know, to prove that you've actually got a functional service, uh, basically. So lots of booter services, actually the majority, report on their websites how many attacks they do every day, which is really useful for us. Um, and we did some negative vulnerable regression modeling on our time series data to estimate the size of different effects. So for our qualitative analysis, uh, we did a bunch of stuff. We did interviews with booter providers. So we emailed them, got on their chat channels, and spoke to them. And we also interviewed law enforcement agents, uh, so in the US and the UK. Uh, and in addition to these, uh, we also scraped a lot of chat channels on um, Discord and Telegram, um, which are websites uh, that a lot of these booter providers use um, to sort of speak to their customer base and kind of try and build a community around the service. So what were the actual results? As you can see here, uh, we've modelled over time uh, a number of interventions. Um, so as you can see here, from about the start of 2016 to, I'll just move that there, uh, sort of uh, beginning of 2019 there, uh, we've got a great time series of attacks over time and a number of interventions. So we've modelled here the ones that were uh, that appeared to have a significant effect, um, uh, which I'll discuss in more detail uh, in a second, and. I should be able to get up the self, uh, yeah, the attack sizes. So this is kind of our, our, um, our modeling output. And here's the self-reported data. I, I really love this slide because um, you don't usually get this kind of very detailed information for criminal markets because they usually don't report what they're actually up to. Um, but yeah, as and you can see here, we've got this self-reported attack data as well, um, which I'll kind of pop back to when I'm discussing the different interventions. So what did we find? So looking at kind of traditional policing interventions, so this is what we can make all like things like uh, arresting people, uh, arresting individuals, um, and sentencing people. Um, we don't really see any consistent effect at all. So if we look back, there's a bunch of sentencing uh, stuff going on here. So there's a few, a few different sort of uh, interventions, and as you can see, there are some effects. There were actually quite a few more sentencing interventions that didn't have any effect. But where effects do occur, they're usually really time limited. So there's sort of these little little blips, basically, um, that don't seem to cause any any like long term damage to the market. Equally for rests, and as you can see here, in the self reported attack series, we don't see really much effect at all from from sentencing. Um, where we do see effects, these tend to be quite limited to jurisdictions, that that kind of with clear extradition arrangements of the country this is going on in. It's the same with arrests. So someone gets arrested and sentenced in the US, you might see an effect on US attack traffic, but not necessarily Russian attack traffic. There was one arrest uh, that where we did see um, that had a sort of associated single takedown with it, um, where police took down the booter as well. And this is the web stressor takedown. This was the Dutch police took down what at the time was the biggest booter service in the world. 
And there was a decent sized effect, roughly a 25% drop in attacks localized in the US and uh, Europe. But it only lasted two weeks. Um, and this was the biggest booter in the world. And as you can see here, this is the web search tick down. We see a big drop in traffic. But then within two weeks, it is pretty much back to normal. And as you can see here as well, the market structure hasn't really changed. So beforehand, you've got a bunch, a lot of different medium-sized booter services. Uh, each of these area things is uh, one, the attacks done by one booter service. And then afterwards, as you can see, it's not really changed at all. It's um, it's still lots of sort of medium-sized booter services still operating. They've all kind of sprung back up. Um, so yeah, if uh, arrest and sentencing don't work uh, or don't seem to work very well, um, how do website takedowns work? So we call this kind of, we decided to call this sort of infrastructural policing, basically. So where uh, centralized law enforcement agencies target not just the infrastructure, so like botnets, uh, reflectors, the servers that these booter services use, but also uh, the people that run them. Uh, so we saw two main interventions. Uh, the first of these we can see at the start here. So the first intervention was um, effectively when all the booters left this kind of hack forums form. Um, when they closed their booter section and said, we're not going to allow you to advertise um, booter services anymore. So this is actually a law enforcement in intervention. Um, uh, American law enforcement got in touch with the administrators of this website and said, look, you will you probably want to get rid of this uh, or there's going to be trouble and uh that's what happened they closed the booter section and we see an immediate and fairly longer term than for arrests drop in uh, attack traffic so uh ddos attacks when you when they when you lose this kind of centralized shop front uh you see a reduction in ddos attacks of about 28 percent uh for around two months uh and then we see it sort of recovers uh gradually over time uh, and the other big sort of uh, attack against booter infrastructure we see um, in the time period we modelled is in Christmas 2018. So this was a massive sort of sting operation by uh, a number of law enforcement agencies, but particularly the FBI, internationally coordinated. This um, targeted 13 uh, booter services, uh, specifically taking their websites offline and also made a number of arrests, uh, targeted the sort of server administrators, the people doing this kind of infrastructural work, making sure these kind of these services um, are maintained. And as you can see, there's a really big uh, effect of this. So um, we see roughly 39% drop in DDoS attacks for around two months. And so similarly, these two interventions both last around two months in terms of their effects. So as you can see here, this is what the websites were replaced with. When we look at the self-reported data, we can see a really sh incredible transformation in the market as a result of this. So as we saw before, for the single arrest and takedown, um, the market before and the market after don't look particularly different. But for this, um, these, these sort of wide-ranging arrests, we take down a lot of, a lot of the infrastructure, um, or at least uh, take out a lot of the shop fronts. As you can see, there's this colossal change to the market. Whereas before you've got one fairly big service and a bunch of medium sized and sort of fairly big ones as well. After the intervention, you can see almost all of the attack traffic is coming from this one booter service, like a, it's well, more than half. And as this has grown over time, this has been a permanent effect on the market. So this service is now the biggest in the world. It accounts for roughly sort of 70 or 80% of, um, of booter attacks come from this one service now. So it's been a long lasting transformation to the market. And we think that this stuff is particularly effective because in the booter world, these these are even even the people running these services aren't particularly skilled. And a lot of the work behind this is quite boring, right? It's basically system administration. You're administering this big botnet or this reflector network or these sort of command servers. And and that work is really quite boring. It's not like kind of, you know, exciting, creative hacking. It's essentially administration. People don't particularly enjoy doing it. It's quite difficult and fiddly work. And that means it has largely centralized around the big services, the sort of the top 10 are the ones running most of this infrastructure. And that means that um, if you take them out, it has a huge knock on effect on the rest of the ecosystem. Now, this is my favorite bit of the talk. Um, we also looked at, and we were, didn't originally actually even set out to look at this, um, we also looked at another type of intervention as well as kind of uh, 
traditional arrest and sentencing and um, looking at infrastructure, like taking down, like takedowns. Um, we looked at this thing called what we call influence policing. So this is the use of advertising. So you might not expect this to be particularly effective. Effectively, this is providing targeting adverts at customers of these services saying, they just say, you know, booting is illegal, watch out, we're on to you. Um, so we looked at um, a campaign run by the NCA in the UK, which was a Google Ads campaign. So it was six months of adverts targeted uh, at young men searching for booter services online. So you type in booter into a Google search, that's how most people get into this, and find their first few booter services. And uh, when you did that, you'd get an advert coming up saying, booting is illegal, you know, we're on to you, basically. You know, this is not expensive, it's a few thousand pounds to buy six months of these adverts. And so how did it work? It worked astonishingly well. So this is a normalized time series, so it's indexed. So um ah, sorry there. It's indexed, so um they've been normalized so we can display them on the same graph. But this is US and UK attack traffic uh, compared over the period we modeled. So as you can see, in 2016 they follow each other extremely closely. In 2017, we see a bit of divergence, but ultimately they're both sort of um essentially trending up at the same same rate. And then in at the end of 2017, we see this uh, the American type series keeps going up, uh, but there's this complete flatlining of booter traffic, uh, booter attacks in the UK, in um, for this sort of six months period here, and it actually starts to even go down towards the end. And at the end of that period, it sort of remembers what it's up to, and it starts to follow the US series again. So what's astonishing is this this period we've highlighted in grey here is the period that the NCA were running these booter anti-booting ads. So they appear to be, as far as we can tell from our data, uh, extremely effective or at least very highly correlated with this this um, complete cessation in growth of attack traffic. So why do we think this is? Effectively, the people that are using these services tend not to do it for very long, basically. They tend to be young, immature kids uh, who are doing some sort of like doing this, experimenting with it, um, basically doing it to irritate uh, and annoy people and to troll people. Um, and there's a very high turnover of views, you know, people tend to grow out of it after sort of four or five years. And it's defended on some fairly flimsy, what we call neutralizations. Basically, people convince themselves either that it's not illegal, um, that it is so, you know, it's so petty that the police don't care about it, which is, um, although the police do care about it, it's largely true, you're unlikely to get arrested just for carrying out these attacks. And so people think it's, it's essentially low risk and they can just experiment with it. Um, there's a kind of mutual shifting of risk. The providers, basically, the people running the infrastructure, uh, make the argument, oh, well, you know, my user is the one carrying it attacks. I'm just providing infrastructure, so it's not illegal. This is uh, not true and um, does not offer you any legal protection. Um, and the users tend to believe correctly that actually it's the providers that are taking the biggest risk. Um, and they don't really have any technical skill of their own. So what we believe is that by kind of countering this, it's, 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 it ends up being a very powerful intervention because you get all these low-skilled people who are just sort of experimenting and trying to find booter services. And then as they're doing that, you kind of um, put an advert up into their stream of consciousness, uh, which shifts them into thinking about the risks involved. So in conclusion, um, we found uh, in our study that actually the market for British services is particularly susceptible, we think, to law enforcement intervention, even though it is this sort of diffuse uh, international market. We think there are things that law and centralised law enforcement can do um, in order to intervene here. Um, but we found that sort of traditional policing interventions, things like arrest and sentencing that are focused around jurisdiction, so where like, you, know, you have jurisdiction to arrest people within, within your own nation, um, tend not to work. Um, or at least they don't seem to really have any big effect on the market. That's not that surprising. I mean, this problem of displacement is really the big one. Um, you know, if 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 I see someone being arrested in America and I'm running a British service in Russia, that doesn't necessarily bother me because I think, well, the FBI aren't going to be any trouble to me. Uh, but what we do see is that um, the use of this targeted meshing seems to work very well, and wide-ranging infrastructure takedowns appear to have like long lasting effect or at least reasonably long lasting effects on these markets. And we think this is because of two things. Firstly we think that um 
on the provider side, it's very centralized. So the actual, there are loads of these services, but actually the infrastructure work, the administration work, the infrastructure itself is pretty centralized around a small number of, of the kind of top services that everyone else buys their capacity from. And that means if you can make life a bit more boring and a bit more tedious and potentially a bit more risky for these uh, administrators, um, that then, as a, we find, has a big effect on the market. Um, equally, on the side of the users, we think that this kind of high turnover thing is important. So you, unlike the provider market, which is very centralized, the user market is very dispersed. There's not a lot of um, what we call like collective efficacy. There's not a lot of... Um, there's not much of a kind of big shared subculture or kind of shared values. And people tend to cycle out of this community pretty, pretty quickly. Um, so what that means is if you can sort of prevent people from getting involved in the first place, if you can sort of divert them away with these targeted adverts, that seems to be pretty effective in reducing um, uh, booter attacks overall and, and, and intervening in this market. So... Basically, what we're seeing here in both cases is a form of like effectively territorialization. So these are ways in which the police are kind of adapting to this sort of international character of the internet, the ways that which these centralized agencies are adapting to these problems of jurisdiction. Cool. Uh, so just to finish up, these are my details. Uh, I'm very happy to answer any questions anyone has. Uh, please feel free to get in touch on Twitter, or, or which is at Johnny Hidstone or um, on my email, uh, Ben Collier, CL Kamakuk. And if you're interested in reading more about these results, um, we published them in 2019 at the Internet Measurement Conference. Uh, so feel free to have a read of that. Thanks.